Thank you for Beyond the Impossible, Unlocking the Future of Physics. We're so glad that you can join us for a really wonderful program in which we are going to chat with three of our illustrious uh, laureates, and we're going to take a look forward a bit into the future of physics. Trust me, we'll have some very popular topics for you. We'll also dig into some areas that you may not be so familiar with in an uh, effort to enlighten you about what's out there on the horizon for the future of physics. So if you'll just hang with us, we'll begin our program in just a few moments. Again, I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer, Planetarium Programs Director, and you've joined us for our program this evening, Beyond the Impossible, Unlocking the Future of Physics. We'll be with you shortly. Good evening, everyone. Yes, you've come to the right place. Welcome to our program this evening, Beyond the Impossible, Unlocking the Future of Physics. I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer, Planetarium Programs Director at the Franklin Institute, your host for our program this evening. And if you'll just hang with us, we'll be getting started in just a few moments. Good evening, everyone. I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer and Planetarium Programs Director at the Franklin Institute. Thank you for joining our program this evening, Beyond the Impossible, Unlocking the Future of Physics. Our program is going to take us uh, into a look into the future of some things in, in physics that you may be familiar with, and we'll also delve into some areas that will be new for you. But you know, I know it will be exciting all the way around. We have three excellent presenters this evening, all of them 2023 Franklin Institute Awards laureates joining us to help us take a look out beyond the horizon. So if you'll just hang with us for a few minutes, we'll begin soon. However, just sit back, relax, and enjoy this video. If a scientist asks a question, you think you know what the answer is, or you have an idea about what the answer is, then there's an endless sea of questions. What these interfaces should be like. We had to sort of invent it as we went, but sometimes you have to invent something new. If we're going to achieve meaningful change, we're going to have to be willing to take uncomfortable steps. Every record needs a timeline, and these climate records also need a timeline. You have to follow the science. Until we teach engineers how to think about both sides of doing good, I think we're destined to repeat stuff. We spend a lot of our time figuring out why things aren't working the way we expect. Part of the fun of science is that we're always learning. We're always sort of at the frontier of knowledge and trying to push that ahead. When you are in love and you are passionate about the topics that you are working on, you may discover something that you have not been looking for. And this happens when you ask curiosity-driven questions. Being the lab scientist it is not only the equations, but always just kind of chasing the crazy idea that explains that new territory which had never been explored before. I think it's very important to always be curious and at the same time to be doubting. You often don't understand the power of the question. It's actually more important than the answer.
Good evening. I'm Larry Dubinsky, president and CEO of the Franklin Institute. And welcome to this evening's program, Beyond the Impossible, Unlocking the, Unlocking the Future of Physics. The individuals you just saw on your screen are all members of the Franklin Institute Awards Class of 2023. With exceptional accomplishments in fields ranging from sustainable energy to quantum physics, they will each be honored by the Franklin Institute next week at the Franklin Institute Awards Ceremony next Thursday, April 27th. The laureates join a nearly 200-year-old legacy at the Institute that includes many giants of science history, Marie Curie, Nikolai Tesla, Orville Wright, Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, and modern greats like Jane Goodall, Bill Gates, Jim Allison, and Francis Arnold. With a mission to inspire passion for learning about science and technology, the Franklin Institute is proud to be the most visited museum in Pennsylvania and a national leader in STEM education. As we head into the spring, we're thrilled to see our Science Center bustling with activity from our engaging exhibits to intensive programs for middle and high school students to the magic of the Disney 100 exhibition. We're also excited that tomorrow night for the season finale of Abbott Elementary, the Emmy and Golden Globe Award winning program on ABC, the Franklin Institute will be highlighted as those students have the field trip of a lifetime at the Franklin Institute. A great honor that the Institute, home to 200,000 school kids that come on field trips every year to see it in this light. We're especially excited though about next week, the upcoming awards week. And tonight's program kicks off a series of events that feature our 2023 laureates in engaging our community in informative discussions around their exceptional achievements in science and engineering. Guiding tonight's conversation is our own chief astronomer and planetarium programs director, Derek Pitts, who for decades has shared his curiosity about the stars and almost every other area of science with Franklin Institute audiences from around the world. Thank you for joining us this evening. Now I turn it over to Derek. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us. With three of the most luminous scientists of modern times, we can't help but to have a brilliant look towards the future of our world, particularly through the lens of their respective fields in physics and engineering. Joining me tonight to look forward are Dr. Monica Schleier-Smith, recipient of the 2023 Benjamin Franklin Next Gen Award and Associate Professor of Physics at Stanford University. Dr. Nader Engeta, recipient of the 2023 Benjamin Franklin Medal in Electrical Engineering and Professor of Electrical and Systems Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. And Dr. Philip Kim, recipient of the 2023 Benjamin Franklin Medal in Physics and Professor of Physics and Applied Physics at Harvard University. You'll find excellent profiles of each of our Franklin awardees at our website, www.fi.edu. Our exploration tonight is about what comes next in science and particularly the ways in which discoveries at the frontiers of physics can be channeled into benefits that might improve the quality of life for all. This isn't a forum for prediction or venture capitalist speculation, but a chance to riff, if you will, from what's happening now to what today's, to what today's realizations point to just beyond the horizon. I've developed a few questions to start our journey toward that horizon, but we encourage our viewers to help us look over that horizon with your questions as they may develop during tonight's discussion. Use the comments function to submit your questions and we'll try to get to as many as possible during the program. Again, thank you very much for joining us. Let's have a great evening. So good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. We're so pleased to have you with us for this program this evening. Each of you work at the bleeding edge of your fields. Dr. Kim in low dimensional materials, Dr. Ngeti in electromagnetic wave manipulation and metamaterials, and Dr. Schleier-Smith in quantum physics. So here's my 
question for each of you. I'll ask if you'll give a 30 second description of your field of expertise to set up your response to this question. What's the cutting edge research in each of your disciplines that could have the most impact on everyday life? And again, I'm not asking for my friends in the venture capitalist world, just interested in helping people understand what's coming next. Dr. Angeta, let's start with you. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, Derek. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, all of you and all the audience. Uh, in my field, we are interested in physics and engineering of waves, particularly electromagnetics and optical waves like microwave and light. And in order to use these waves to achieve new useful functionalities, we need to manipulate them. We need to control them in a very unusual way. And for that, we need specialized materials. That's what, you know, in my field, we are interested in exploring uh, various different material platforms that can manipulate waves in order to endow them with the interesting novel concepts. Now, you mentioned, Derek, what is the cutting edge in this field? Uh, I think uh, in this field, one of the cutting edge is uh, how to control light matter interaction at the nanometer scale. And that has, you know, a lot of interesting uh, potential and appli potential application like ultra fast computing, uh, like imaging, you know, uh, forming uh, images with the very, very thin layers of materials and sensing. We can talk more about this as we go through this program. Thank you very much, Dr. Ngeta. Uh, Dr. Slyer Smith, you're up next. Thanks. So uh, in my lab, we use lasers as a way to bring atoms close to absolute zero temperature. And that's really a starting point um, for having model systems for studying quantum mechanics. And there are a couple of aspects of quantum mechanics that I'm fascinated by. One is quantum uncertainty. You may have heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that says that you can't know where something is and how fast it's moving at the same time. Um, another one is quantum entanglement, um, which says that information doesn't have to be stored just in individual bits as it is on, on your computer, um, but can actually be stored in some correlations between particles, that there's uh, information that's delocalized and, um, for example, spread across different atoms. And so um, in terms of the applications um, on the sort of side of quantum uncertainty, understanding how to manipulate that quantum uncertainty um, is essential to pushing precision measurements towards their limits. And those might be measurements of magnetic fields that could ultimately, um, as we learn to manipulate this uncertainty, have implications for things like medical imaging. Um, uh, and the phenomenon of entanglement is one that could revolutionize the way we process information and give rise to powerful new types of computers. Great, thank you very much. And Dr. Kim? Yes, uh, thanks uh, Thanks for the invitations, first of all. I think it was my pleasure to be here. Um, so th the, my research interest is uh, kind of discovering new materials and especially new quantum materials. And uh, this quantum material is usually considered as a platform to realize many interesting quantum technologies as well, such as quantum computing, quantum sensing, quantum communications. But as a material, it consists of the many atoms and molecules, electrons, and a lot of constituent kind of mixed in a rather complicated way. So understanding such a complicated system, we need a new framework to understand the, their interactions and disentangle such a complicated uh, interactions into the simpler form and how one can apply the quantum mechanics to understand those kind of the complicated phenomena becomes quite important issues. And once you understand those kind of phenomena, that will allow us to design the new material and come up with a new type of this material platform to realize new type of applications. So those kind of the, uh, the quantum material research has been the, uh, my interest and was also a fast growing field in, uh, in, in, in the condensed matter physics area. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. I'm certainly looking forward to the advances that come out. I can hear applications that I think will readily apply to me and that I'm looking forward to uh, coming coming soon, hopefully. Uh, let's go on to our, to our next question here. You're right, actually, that we will come back and talk more about these, uh, but just sort of like laying out some of the groundwork for thinking about uh, the future. British science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke uh, had several laws about how things go in the future. 
And one of them is uh, this saying that I think most of us are familiar with, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. What do you think will be the advanced technology uh, or theoretical or applied physics that will be indistinguishable from magic in the not too distant future? I think maybe Nader can start it out because that's a where that you can easily create the magic. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Philip. You know, I'd be happy to uh, to start. Yes, I mean uh, one of the interesting uh, uh, issue is the issue of computations. Actually, you've heard from our my, my, our friends in the panel. Computation plays an important role in various different aspects. Whether it would be quantum computing, whether it would be quantum materials that Philip mentioned with regard to computation. And in our field, also computation plays a very important role. So one of the interesting questions we have been interested in is that can we actually design uh, specialized materials that when interacts with light can actually do analog computation at the near speed of light. And, uh, and particularly if we can bring that into the nanoscale. So imagine, for example, that the, uh, the analog computers uh, of... Uh, uh, near future, hopefully, uh, would be at the uh, atomic scale, would be at the nano scale, and then you can actually compute with the near speed of light. Uh, this is something that I think is uh, one of the interesting aspects of light matter interaction, and particularly if you can actually design structures that can manipulate light at that scale, this would, and this is one of the areas that we have been working on. Wow. Okay. Yes, I can certainly see. I mean, for, for many of us already, you know, thinking how we use the devices that we use, all of these digital devices, I mean, it seems in, in many ways like we have black boxes in front of us that do incredible things. And of course, you know, many of us don't think about how, how they actually work. But I think many people probably think of it as, as magic. But from what I understand you're saying, the ability to make things actually move even faster and compute even faster uh, will significantly improve uh, how we interact with the world. And in much smaller scales and also low power. And, 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 that's, a, and that's a really important component of this is that's right. the, the power and the size. Right. Yeah. yeah. I can think of a lot of applications. That does sound like magic. I think it's magical already. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I think in the material side, uh, there are kind of many also magical phenomena one can create if it works well, even in the ambient condition. I think superconductivity is one of these uh, really magical system. I don't know whether um, anyone just kind of, you can Google that uh, the magnetic levitation out of superconductor. There is a real famous photographs. I, I remember the seeing that a small wrestler actually levitate on the top of the, this uh, gigantic superconductor. Um, I think that uh, visibly look like the magic. I think you get going against of the this gravity and floated, uh, the, uh, floating over the space, uh, the uh, empty space. I think that surely look like the magic. Um, right now, I think uh, to realize those kinds of superconductivity, we need to cool, cool down the, uh, the known superconductor, fairly low temperature. I think um, the, uh, around the negative, uh, what is it? The record is 100, uh, negative 120 degrees in, the, uh, the, uh, in just the typical atmosphere uh, pressure. Uh, but certainly that people have been looking for, including myself, that uh, the superconductor can be a super, superconductor is in much higher temperature, hopefully in the closed room temperature, where then you can even see that this magical phenomena in this kind of ambient condition. I thought kind of uh, as we progress uh, one day that maybe we should be able to find out uh, this uh, room temperature superconductivity and room pressure. Yeah, that would be magical, you're right. You know, it's a, I know that uh, in, in science museums, in our science museum and other science museums, you know, one of the, what, what can I say, standard demonstrations that was presented to the public, uh, you know, about, about a decade ago, or maybe a little bit sooner than that, was a demonstration of superconductivity using liquid nitrogen to cool magnets to really low temperatures. 
And that certainly had that appearance. And we could talk about applications for transportation and other things. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's interesting that the combination of what I hear from uh, Dr. Nguyen and from you, Dr. Kim, about, about the role of materials and then coupling that with superconductivity you know, seems like it has some serious implications. And, and Dr. Schleier-Smith, I'm, I'm thinking that with, you know, with, with quantum entanglement and the ability to uh, communicate information uh, in the ways that you described uh, earlier, I'm, I'm thinking that putting all of these things together is, is going to start to reshape uh, our world physically mostly because we're talking about being able to reduce the size and reduce the speed. And I'm thinking that perhaps quantum entanglement will have a great deal to do with that because of the ease of then uh, sharing information around all these networks that help all this stuff to work across all these applications. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing I would add um, I myself, I was going to evade the question and say, I don't want to predict the technology. I want to be surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that actually um, the example of superconductivity that, that just came up is a very nice one where um, uh, even seeing even the highest temperature superconductors existing today, it wasn't obvious that such a thing um, should be possible. It was a surprise that was found um, in, in the lab. And one of the questions you can ask is sort of where might I find new emergent behaviors where I have some interacting system of quantum particles, be it the electrons in the superconductor or the atoms in, in our laboratory, um, where the collective behavior is somehow fundamentally distinct from just the sum of the parts, right? There's this new phenomenon of superconductivity that emerges. Um, as we start to sort of build up um, entangled systems, um, uh, you know, that perhaps with, with the goal of, of, uh, of, of being able to compute, right? But more generally, we can ask the system what, question, what is the sort of new emergent collective behavior that we'll see that's really fundamentally different and might surprise us? Um, and I hope that there will be more surprises in our future. Yeah, thank you for bringing that point out. You know, we use these, I mean, I use this this language to talk about the future of physics. And, you know, it's extraordinarily dangerous, I realize, to use that word in this way. Although it certainly is engaging for an audience, you know, to join a program like this. But I, I think your your way of saying it, of, of, of emerging uh, technologies and trends is a, is, a, is a great way to describe that. And I certainly recognize the dangers of uh, trying to quote unquote predict the future. I've been involved in programs before where we uh, have talked about the future of something happening, uh, and then the future changing before we got the you know the construction completed. So I just want our audience to also understand that that we get that point. Uh, may, may I add something to that, uh, Derek? Absolutely. As as just to follow up with what Monica and Philip mentioned. Yes, uh, it, it is hard to predict, you know, a scientific discovery, uh, but perhaps it's more difficult to predict technological development because uh, te technological development not only depends on sci scientific discoveries, but also depends on other aspects like societal needs and so on. And, uh, and there are many examples, by the way, in technology and engineering one can mention. For example, let's say the cell phone that we have now. I mean, if you go back, you know, uh, I mean, a few decades, some of these technologies based on the scientific discoveries that were developed at that time, but also in order to get to the technological aspect, many other things had to come into play. Batteries had to become smaller, batteries had to become more efficient, you know, all of those in order to put all of this together. And now we have the smartphone that we all have. So uh, I agree with Monica and with you and with Philip that, you know, it's hard to predict the future, but maybe even harder to predict the technological aspect of that. Yeah, that's a really excellent point. Thanks for pointing that out. Greatly appreciate that. I, I think that, you know, this sort of leads me to uh, the next question I have that's sort of tangentially related to this. Uh, and and it, is a, it is somewhat about society and societal needs and the effects of technology on society. Robert Oppenheimer, one of the nuclear physicists who worked in the 1940s on the Manhattan Project, developing uh, America's nuclear weapons, was deeply conflicted ethically about that work. Uh, we have 
we've all you know been aware of what he's what he said following the work that he did in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, but can you can you talk a little bit about which disciplines will be the most ethically challenging uh, for both scientists and non scientists alike? May I just uh, just uh, start that? I mean, uh, I think one of the uh, interesting topic that these days we hear that in the news is uh, artificial intelligence and uh, chat GPT. And uh, so it's a fascinating topic, uh, which has, of course, long history in artificial intelligence, but it's interesting to see how it's being developed and what direction does it go. And not only depends, of course, on the physics of computation and engineering aspect, but also it's, it's, it's an important point to re- realize what direction it's going. Uh, the issue of emergence that's coming out of this AI and so on. So it's an inter- important topic that the scientists, all of us uh, technologists, need to talk about it. Uh, right, I, I completely agree with that. I think that uh, I think it was, in a sense, kind of shocking that uh, that something that uh, kind of deeply that kind of throw that kind of rather deep questions of what is a really intelligence or what is a emotions and feeling that what is a creativity. I think that's kind of the, a lot of things that we we thought it was granted for the uh, the kind of human nature is somewhat now. Being questions, I think it was a deep question that so we have to just understand, right? Uh, how fast and how far this uh, artificially art, artificial intelligence will develop? I think that's kind of uh, uh, kind of quite in, uh, the technical questions, but also it is a kind of deeply rooted a lot, a lot of these uh, philosophical so ethical questions around. I think uh, there are certainly that um, it's not only scientists and uh, engineers, but also general public kind of discussion is also necessary just to understand the impact and how we can just kind of be, be deal with those kind of the, uh, the development that kind of we have. I think that's, uh, I completely agree with Nader. I think that's one of the kind of recent development, but is a very deep development I can see. Yeah, I think it's worth keeping in mind that sort of, you know, any technological, de- most technological developments, they can be used um, for good or they can be used um, for evil. And there's perhaps also some murky space in between this, particularly in the case of AI, where um, it's it's hard to even uh, uh, say exactly where it's going. But um, uh, certainly with the example of nuclear technology, right, it uh, has, has um, uh, great uses for energy. Um, there's certainly the um, fear that of, of destruction from nuclear weapons, right? And, and so there are um, there are two sides to these coins. I think sort of looking ahead, um, let's say if, if quantum computers can break existing crypto systems, right? That's, there's sort of questions about who has access to that technology um, and uh, uh, how, how does that get used? Um, and uh, so uh, I, I would say this will be an ongoing tension um, of sort of the, uh, who has access to the technology, what are the different uses um, uh, and making sure that we channel things into where they're uh, benefiting society. In scenarios like this one uh, with uh, AI and chat GPT and, and, and other products like this, is there any sense or need, do you think, that, uh, w- that there's another way for us to approach this? I mean, the other way for me to ask this is, do we, you know, for how this has impacted the public so far, uh, is the genie out of the bottle? Has the horse left the barn? Uh, do we need to sort of do a different way of considering uh, uh, chain or, or tech, emerging technologies like this? Is there a different way for us to approach this? I mean, I would I would say we can't and don't want to stop the you know the growth of technology, the invention of new technologies, um, and so. Uh, all we can do is try to steer them in in the way that they're beneficial, right? Um, and uh, that we're thoughtful about how we use them. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Monica. I think uh, the issue is that aware, I think awareness is important in every aspect uh, of. It. In other words, when when uh, when the society and community is aware of what each of these technologies are, I mean, uh, what is the fundamental science behind it? what is the aspects of engineering of that, and the, which possible direction it can go. Of course, as we talked about, we can predict the future, 
but just the awareness of how these things are being developed, that actually helps. And, and Monica is absolutely right. I think every, any technology you pick up, even a simple telephone, when it was invented back in the 19th century, you can actually think about what good things it can do. Of course, the telephone is very important, and, but also can have negative aspect. So that negative aspect should not stop you know, our, our, our curiosity and our motivation to develop the fields further and further. So it just needs the awareness that we can go over here. Right. I think that uh, I completely agree with kind of what has been said. And then, uh, in a sense, kind of raising the awareness. <clears throat> and um, also, it feels, uh, I feel like it's kind of important also to talk to kind of many different expertise and different expert groups. It's not only just kind of now the developer of the AI is that they can be involved, but should kind of talk to with the um, uh, other groups and that kind of uh, inform that what, what is the impact of the, this one. Uh, likewise, that uh, the developers are kind of should listen uh, general publics as well as other expertise uh, that what, what could be the, the implication of this technological development and make sure that we can steer the, everything in the kind of right directions um, before it kind of spins out the hands that can uncontrollable way. Yeah, that's great. I, I appreciate your responses on that. It, it, it makes me feel as if places like the Franklin Institute will always have work to do uh, to help the general public understand uh, these emerging technologies and how we should relate to them. Uh, so at least I'll have a job for a little while longer. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, let's take a little bit of a turn. Uh, I'm going to jump into something that I, I know that a lot of the general public has uh, questions about and is interested in uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, uh, but we see the, the emerging developments uh, in space exploration. And uh, everyone is excited these days uh, with the commercial expansion that's taking place in the space exploration field, particularly the work that's being done by SpaceX, um, hopefully you all heard about and many others uh, heard about the uh, flight test that was supposed to happen on Monday, may happen tomorrow, of this new uh, super rocket, the uh, Starship, uh, that is meant to carry large payloads and large numbers of people, dozens of people potentially, uh, because of its launch capability. And, you know, the intent of this is to uh, get us off the planet, out to the moon, and maybe on to Mars. But when I think about the human exploration of the universe uh, beyond our solar system, I mean that in and of itself as a sentence is kind of difficult to uh, put out there. But that kind of human exploration beyond our solar system, in a sense, is unthinkable unless we can shrink the universe somehow. Uh, I think the general public is not really clear on how big the universe is and what it will take to traverse, you know, large, large volumes of the universe. Do you think it's possible that we may ever be able to achieve a faster than light trans, uh, transport system that will allow us to visit other parts of the galaxy uh, by shortening the amount of time it takes us to get from one place to another. We know that this is, this is stock and trade for you know, all of the fantasy television programs and movies about space exploration and those sorts of things. And you know, it's, it's fueled a lot of interest for people, but what's, what's the reality of what we might be able to do? Oh, well, I think that uh, as far as our understanding of the current physics law, that uh, superlumino that traveling is uh, not possible, uh, but that's uh, within the, the boundary of the, our understanding at this point. Now, I would say that, well, it could change this in the future. Who knows? I think uh, there is a new framework of this, how to look at the, at the physics can happen. And then indeed, somebody may break that, that, uh, the limits and, and the kind of new way. But I guarantee that if that happens, that will be really revolutionary and something that beyond that uh, I can understand or we can understand uh, as a kind of group of the physicist, the modern physicist, uh, the view. So um, again, that we can just kind of look back the histories that uh, the several there the occasions that uh, before that Albert Einstein's special relativity, or the relativity 
relativistic theory comes around, uh, we did understand that how the uh, uh, things can be different when uh, the speed, uh, the object speed approaching the light, uh, uh, speed of the light. Uh, so there, there is a, a couple of this revolutionary development, like the, the relativity and quantum mechanics is a good example, right? So it's a very difficult kind of that uh, predict something based on the current physics knowledges, right? Uh, but nevertheless, I think that within the our frame of the understanding that uh, going the fast and speed of the light is probably uh, not possible in uh, within our understanding. But someday maybe uh, the new type of the framework that come in and then uh, make an un understanding what should it look like uh, once you break the speed of the light and how to do it. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to um, concur with what Philip said and, and just maybe add a few thoughts. So, um, and if you made me place a bet, I would say, no, we're never going to travel, travel faster than the speed of light, but we should always be looking for surprises. Um, uh, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity sets the speed of light as a fundamental speed limit, and it's been tested extraordinarily well. Um, quantum mechanics, you know, sometimes people hear some th things about quantum mechanics and hear this term quantum teleportation and think it means you can travel faster than the speed of light. Not true. Um, quantum mechanics preserves this um, requirement that information cannot travel faster than the speed of light, let alone matter. Um, um, so each of those theories is, has been tested extraordinarily well and um, uh, the speed of light remains a fundamental limit. Um, you know, if you were going to look for surprises, I think a place to look for surprises would be trying to get into regimes um, where gravity and quantum mechanics both play a role, which is very difficult to do. Um, quantum mechanics usually governs um, things that are very small, like atoms um, or electrons. Um, gravity governs, uh, you know, massive, uh, massive objects and getting to a regime where both play a role is extraordinarily difficult. Um, but this is the place where there might be interesting questions. Um, relativity treats space and time on an equal footing. In quantum mechanics, time is, is really fundamentally different from space. Um, and so if one can start to sort of look in the regime um, where both of these theories matter, that's where you'd be, I, I would say, where you'd look if you're looking for surprises. And that uh, requires um, extraordinary advances still um, in terms of what we can do in the lab. Yeah, I can follow up with that. I completely agree with what Philip and Monica mentioned. And uh, let me just add also another uh, thought, or maybe slightly revise, uh, uh, Derek, your question. And that is, uh, yes, of course, as was mentioned, uh, the speed of light is the fastest speed, you know, for transfer of information, as Monica and Philip mentioned. But would it be possible to actually move object with the speed, obviously less than speed of light, but try to increase that speed as much as possible? And imagine for a moment, for example, the material that Philip is working on is the two-dimensional material. And somehow you can actually move that two-dimensional material that is very, very light by the pressure of light. And how fast can you actually move that? And I know there are several research groups that are looking at the concept of light sail. In other words, could we actually use laser light in order to move very, very, very light uh, object to to higher uh, to the speed obviously still less than the speed of light obviously but they can this speed be uh, high enough that can actually shorten the travel uh, from one place to another place and uh, so the, in that case the two dimensional material that Philip is working on can play a very important role uh, in order to use light and to try to move the object. Uh, Again, within the bound of, you know, special uh, and general theory of relativity, as Monica mentioned, but nevertheless try to see how we can actually increase the current speed of the regular objects that we deal with. Yeah, that's a really great point, Dr. Ngata. The uh, If I remember correctly, there is a project called the Breakthrough Project yeah. Yeah. Uh, that plans to do something quite similar to that. Right. Uh, so that's exactly as Nader pointed out that uh, that's a project that uh, that you can just make the, this uh, the sailboat in the, in the space and then uh, that, that using the laser to just kind of pro uh, propel that and to make the, this uh, the uh, the sailboat you need a really thin material and very light but uh, nevertheless it actually reflects the lasers uh, quite well efficient way so they can get this propel uh, from this uh, the impinging light. Uh, 
uh, laser light. And one thing that, uh, as Nader mentioned, although that we cannot uh, travel faster than speed of the light, but as the speed uh, of the traveling approach, it uh, approaches the speed of the light. In fact, there is a so-called this length contractions uh, happens and that is, uh, according to spatial relativity. So the, the time that uh, the travelers to reach this uh, the far distance that uh, what where you just kind of stay into the earth uh, is much shorter uh, for the kind of traveler's time scale. So effectively as a traveler that you can in principle reach the shorter time scale than, than uh, that uh, as earthbound observers can see. Um, so there is, there is a kind of within this, even the physics boundary, there is quite unusual, uh, the circumstance can appear. And that could be also interesting, uh, the uh, exploration one can make. Yeah, that's a great point. So uh, perhaps we can't we can't evade the laws, uh, the speed limit of the universe, but perhaps we can uh, figure another way to make the trip a lot shorter, at least anyway. And then with with the with the developments that are coming out of all of your laboratories, we have an opportunity to make things that are incredibly small but highly functional that can deliver us information at least. Uh, from these different, from these distant locations. It sounds like all three of you will be employed for the next <laughs> years or so. <laughs> okay, so uh, so thank you very much for that. I'm sure that satisfies a, a lot of our audience that's interested in, in, uh, in superluminal uh, velocities. Uh, we have a question from our audience. Uh, and uh, if I can, I'll just read it. Uh, one of our audience members would like to ask each of you what you think was the most important scientific accomplishments so far in your respective lifetimes? Uh, Dr. Kim, let's start with you. I'm not sure if you can see the question right on the screen yeah, there. I, I saw that. I, I, I'm seeing that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, tough questions. There are so many uh, very exciting developments in. Uh, okay, so. Uh, my respective lifetime, probably in the past 50 years, I think I can I can count many. <laughs> but if I just kind of uh, select uh, the one, I think as a kind of uh, merge together of the many discovery in kind of one one sentences, I think uh, the realizations of the uh, the new materials, which actually had the, uh, the very different properties than expected. I think. Uh, a few examples uh, in, in the quantum material, I think uh, I mentioned about the superconductors and especially superconductor uh, superconductivity appears in uh, very high temperatures compared with what used to be known to uh, the low temperature superconductor, the TC increases about kind of almost 10 times, uh, five times at the least. I think these are uh, the discovery that we never expected. And uh, actually that mystery has been not been solved in a sense we don't understand why actually it appears such a higher temperature. Um, they related with uh, somewhat different parties uh, when electron is confined into the two dimension applying the strong magnetic field, somehow their motion is uh, rather discrete. And this is what we often call the quantum wave effect. And this type of the effect is also kind of completely unexpected in that when it was discovered and indicating that uh, Indeed, uh, the, sometimes the behavior of this material is uh, very different from what, the, uh, what we usually expect it, especially when it comes with the, uh, not only single particle, uh, but when there's a, a lot of the particles collectively kind of uh, the interact together, then this type of the surprise comes around. I think this type of the collective behavior, surprise coming from the collective uh, behavior is what we often call the emergent phenomena emergent quantum phenomena and discovery of this uh, several emergent quantum phenomena has been one of these uh, kind of big uh, pro, uh, the achievements wow. in the field of the quantum material research. Very cool. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ingeta? Yeah, uh, yes, as uh, Kim, as uh, Philip mentioned, it's uh, during our lifetime so far, there have been so many different technological development that it's, it's, it's very difficult to choose one. But if I were to choose one, I would say the connectivity that the, uh, the wireless communication have provided us, that we all be connected. 
this is amazing, by the way. I remember, you know, as a child, I mean, it was very hard to actually have, use a phone. But now we have every one of us have, you know, smartphones that be constantly connected with everybody in the entire world. And connected to that, that because of this technological platform, then the presence of Internet. I think the presence of Internet and the World Wide Web that used to be called an Internet, it really brings, you know, whole different, you know, uh, uh, universe into play. Uh, and, uh, and this actually also connects with what uh, Philip mentioned with regard to the process of emergence. Now, this time, the, uh, the many different nodes, which would be our, you know, uh, smartphones that all of us are connected, will give rise to interesting set of phenomena that would be emerging coming out of that. So in a sense, we see this, law, uh, this large number of possibilities that this connectivity would allow that. And yes, indeed, I mean, I can see that that's one of the uh, very interesting development, at least during my lifetime, that I've seen so far. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm, I'm probably the youngest. I'm probably the youngest one here, so I had fewer things to choose from. Um, <laughs> and it's still a very, very daunting um, uh, question. So um, I think, you know, I'll just pick something that, that I find fascinating. I won't claim it's the most important, but I think that, um, an, you know, a really important milestone um, was Peter Shore's um, discovery of, of a quantum algorithm that would factor numbers efficiently in a way that would be Im impossible on a classical computer. Um, so that's a theoretical idea. Um, that um, still requires hard work to actually implement, um, uh, it, you know, in, in a way that actually uh, would, uh, you know, for for large numbers where this would have an impact. Um, so this is um, something that I say I say it's important though because of the way that it really kind of stimulated research in this area of how does one develop the experimental tools um, to implement quantum gates um, to build up. Um, uh, exquisite control of quant uh, of particles, be they uh, atoms or ions, um, uh, that can act as quantum bits, um, and that those methods of control have really sort of um, uh, spread into other areas, such as the direction of quantum sensing that I mentioned. Um, so I would say the seminal idea has really opened up um, this whole direction of quantum technologies, um, uh, and I think we're still going to see um, the the fruits of that going forward. Great. Fantastic. Uh, the next question we have uh, was actually originally directed at uh, Dr. Schleier Smith. So uh, we'll start with you on this one and then we'll move on. Dr. Schleier Smith, you mentioned that physics rewards a playful approach and thinking outside of the box. Can you share an example where that was true with your research? Yeah, so um, I think maybe maybe a nice illustration of uh, kind of my playful approach. I mentioned earlier um, this topic of um, how do quantum mechanics and gravity kind of connect to each other, these theories that apply in disparate realms. Um, and that's something that, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I study quantum mechanics. I never thought I had sort of um, any way of studying gravity in, in my lab. Um, and one day um, a uh, theorist, uh, a sort of postdoctoral researcher kind of knocked on my door with um, uh, some some questions about could you do an experiment um, that would allow us to answer some questions that come from thinking about um, what happens to information that falls into a black hole. Um, and actually, I, I still haven't done this experiment. Just I should put that out there up front. Um, but I think um, this stimulated kind of a whole line of um, first of all me learning um, that. Uh, uh, there's this uh, wonderful, um, exciting area of theoretical research um, that tries to uh, is trying to understand these questions about gravity, about what happens to information that falls into a black hole through the lens of quantum mechanics, and that quantum mechanics potentially has has something to teach us there. Um, and uh, this is something where, um, in thinking about, is that a process? This sort of scrambling of information that uh, that falls into a black hole is this something that one could actually study in the lab? And that made us think about sort of what are the experimental tools you would need, um, and actually to build up new ways, new types of interacting quantum systems in our experiments um, that I think of as sort of maybe the equivalent of um, in sort of classical 
communications. There was an era when you talked just to your next door neighbor. And now there's this era where we can talk to anybody over Zoom um, and sort of building up sort of new ways for, for, for quantum mechanical particles, in our case, the atoms to communicate with each other, um, to be able to study new phenomena in the lab is something that this, this really kind of um, triggered us to do. And it's going in directions where um, um, there are potential applications to simulating quantum gravity and tabletop experiments, but also some of the same tools we're starting to think about how we could apply them, um, let's say, to, to computation um, and to new types of quantum sensors. And so um, this is something where it really came out of a playful discussion um, and has really shaped the research direction. Wow, so many possibilities in there. Sounds great. Uh, how about for you, Dr. Kim? All right, so I think uh, there's a very good example in my field about this playful, <laughs> uh, the, the play that we got real into physics. Um, so 20 some years ago that uh, the, there, uh, there are not many, but some of the physicists, including, uh, including me, were looking for a way to create this uh, extremely thin materials that can exist in the universe. I think, uh, uh, the, theoretically, the people realize that if you just kind of extract one single atomic sheet of the graphite, uh, what we call the graphene, uh, that's kind of one of the thinnest material can exist in a really stable way. And um, there are a few people that try to grow this type of the thin materials in various different ways. Um, that I was trying to just kind of make the very small scale of the pencil that uh, tried to kind of uh, cleave off the, these very thin crystals. But the real winner of the, this uh, the competition, although that uh, we didn't know each other very well back then, because it was a very uh, small uh, amount of efforts of the research, was in fact just simply using the scotch tape and repeatedly peel off the, the graphite and until that it can reach the really thin crystal. And this is a kind of really good example. It was a really playful. I think it's uh, like the childish uh, the play around. But nevertheless, I think. Uh, uh, it was a very creative way, in fact, of demonstrating one can get this uh, the thinnest material in the universe with a, such a simple technique. And in fact, that, that was at the starting point of the research of this low dimensional material, especially two dimensional material. Now they become kind of really big, uh, the research effort worldwide. But it, the starting point was it was a really kind of uh, that mis almost mischievous uh, uh, for that <laughs> play around. Yeah. Very cool. Great. Dr. Angeta? Well, uh, for me, uh, I mean, uh, since I am a physicist and electrical engineer at the same time, you know, the out of the box thinking came several years ago when I asked this question that in electrical engineering and in electronics, we have uh, lump circuit elements that we teach our students, you know, capacitor, inductor, resistors. So then I asked this question. Would it be possible to actually have the nanoscale version of these elements for light? Mm. Such that if we have a nanoscale particle that we illuminate with light, they behave as optical capacitor and optical inductor and optical resistors. And that actually led me to come up with that type of, uh, I mean, possibilities. And that was actually the precursor to see how we can get inspiration from electronics as you look at your cell phone inside the electronics of that is a combination of capacitor, inductor, resistor, and then like an alphabet of a language, you put this them together and then you have a lot of different functionalities in electronic and electrical circuits. Why can we do that, for example, in nanoscale optics? And that indeed led us to come up with the design of structures and materials that can do uh, information processing to design a material that can, as, as you send the wave through it, it can actually do mathematical operations, like the design materials that when you send the wave through it, it can actually take the derivative of the profile of that. And eventually we showed that you can design a structure that when you send the wave, you can solve equations. You can solve equation with the nearest speed of light. Wow. Wow. Boy, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Very cool. Uh, just so you know, um, Shannon Burns in our audience who's watching tonight says, you guys rock. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're slowly winding down our time here. And uh, I just wanted to 
uh, ask you, uh, I think we have time for just a couple more questions here. And uh, one of the questions I'd, I'd like to make sure we, we get to is, um, is really about how, how we think about educating people around science. And uh, for this question, uh, I'm just going to go in this direction for this. Uh, our, you know, we all know this, though. Our world and our civilization is approaching some really serious global issues that may have some significant deleterious effects on the quality of life. These issues are going to require hands-on participation of a good portion of the global population to help turn down the threat level, possibly through the use of alternative technologies like renewable energies and G GMO foods, vaccinations against pandemic infections. And these may require re-education of science or at least a new way to relate to science as an ally rather than causation. If you've thought about this, uh, what has crossed your mind about suggestions for the better engagement of the general public in science? I can maybe start with a comment. Um, I, I think that the most important thing is really to start engaging people at a young age with science. Um, and you know, I think there was a there may have, I think in the video that was shown at the start, there was a quote from my colleague Dick Zare, who made the, the, the point that science, it's not just about answers, it's about even just finding the right questions. And sort of that way of thinking, of posing questions, of having curiosity, um, that's something where, you know, I feel fortunate that I was encouraged, encouraged as a kid to participate in science fairs where I got to pose my own questions and try to figure, you know, out how to how to design an experiment to address them. That sort of critical thinking, um, problem solving. Those are things that I think we can be building up from a young age um, and, and should be. So. Yeah, I completely agree with Monica. I think uh, uh, reaching... Uh, uh, students uh, at a very young age and also encouraging them to ask curiosity-driven questions. I mean, why things are working the way it does and so on and so forth. Those questions, you know, would encourage the young minds, I mean, to, to ask the further question. But also it's very important that, uh, uh, that we can, I mean, engage with the general public and to make it very clear and be articulate that, you know, everyday life we deal with science and technology. And that's very important that, you know, the, uh, we have this interaction uh, with general public that science is not separate from everyday life. Science and technology is part of the everyday life, as we have seen many examples of that, particularly during the pandemic. Of course, you saw that, that how it's important, the life sciences, you know, to get the general health to the, to the general public. So we as a scientist, as an educator and mentor, I think it's important for us to engage, you know, with the, uh, articulating uh, the science and excitement about the science and technology to the general public and get them interested. Yeah, I think uh, kind of, I, I completely agree. They all kind of said and kind of one, uh, add one more, one more part is I think um, the event like this, I think the engaging with the kind of general public and that uh, the, the kind of uh, communicate with the kind of different point of view and uh, just uh, to explain that kind of what we are working on, what is our excitement to the kind of in the uh, uh, simpler language. I think this is kind of all important. Act. In some sense, I, I also wish to change this uh, general uh, the public view of the scientists, uh, like the mad scientists kind of locked inside, <laughs> locked inside the lab and just to do something that completely un understandable. I think that's probably not the right pictures of the scientists. Uh, and I wish that uh, also this type of the uh, uh, the opportunities that engage with the general public and that make the kind of conversations. I think that could be very important. Uh, they also the vehicle that uh, we can make the good communications. It's a great message. All three are great messages. And uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm so glad my boss is on to hear this because again, it means I'll be employed for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot of work to do, uh, but uh, I, I think I think uh, we can certainly make a, a, a big dent in this, and uh, you know your your work and your support is really important for this. Uh, our our last question this evening uh, comes from uh, Army Medic. Army Medic says, "I would like to thank the scientists for your time and sharing your phenomenal knowledge of expertise. 
Do you see astronauts landing on the moon again? And is it practical to anticipate a Mars landing? This is a near future question rather than a far future one. Who wants to start? I think definitely it's happening. I mean, it is yeah. uh, it's really, I mean, as you say, it's a near future prediction and very close to what's going to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, my, my guess is that I may see that within my lifetime, but definitely within the uh, Monica's lifetime, she will see it. Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I'll just say, you know, I'm not an expert on uh, space travel. I won't say like what the right time frame is for it, but um, we should never um, stop exploring. We should always be pushing the frontiers. And these are wonderful and exciting examples of that. That's really wonderful. And uh, Dr. Schleier Smith, that is a really wonderful note for us to wrap up our program this evening. Uh, so thank you very much for putting that out there just like that. Uh, folks, we've had a really great evening this evening uh, talking about the possibilities of the future of physics with Dr. Monica Schleier-Smith, who's the recipient of the 2023 Benjamin Franklin Next Gen Award, Dr. Nader Ngeta, the recipient of the 2023 Benjamin Franklin Medal in Electrical Engineering, and Dr. Philip Kim, recipient of the 2023 Benjamin Frank Franklin Medal in Physics. Uh, our awards program comes up next week, and if you go to our website, you can again read their profiles and find out all about the fantastic work that they're doing. Uh, we are so pleased to have them as part of our program and to have the opportunity to honor them and the work that they do. And so thank you all very much for your work, and uh, thank you for being with us this evening. We really do appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, you Derry. Yeah. Thank you, Monica. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Thank Great you all. Yeah. And so, uh, so folks, if you're, you're still with us, I just want to remind you that next week, Tuesday, April 25th, uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Jayatri Das, the chief bioscientist, uh, will be hosting TFI's Conversation Lab event. Uh, and this event features Dr. Deb Niemeyer, educator, civil engineer, champion for environmental justice, and recipient of the 2023 Bauer Award and Prize for Achievement in Science. That's coming up next Tuesday evening, 6.30 to 8 p.m. in our Science Matters Conversation Lab. If you go to the Franklin Institute's website and uh, click on the tab for Franklin Institute Awards, you can learn about this program too. Again, that's next Tuesday, April 25th. So uh, thanks very much for joining us, folks. We greatly appreciate you being with us. And we look forward to you joining us for other programs related to our awards program coming up in the future. Uh, all of you that submitted questions, thank you so very much. We greatly appreciate it. And uh, keep looking up. And as, uh, as Dr. Slyer Smith says, keep that curiosity going. Thanks for joining us, folks. Have a great evening. We'll see you next time. I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer, Franklin Institute. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.